Center. Um, welcome on this frigid night. I'm so glad that you all came. We've got a packed house, um, even with the night change. So it's greatly appreciated that you're all here. Um, whose first time is it at Hill Center? First time. Wow, pretty nice. All right. So we really hope to see you back next week for um, Life of a Poet with Ross Gay on February 6th, the week from today. So hope to see you again as returning guest next time when I ask the same question. <laughs> um, Life of a Poet has become one of my favorite series here. Um, and I'm particularly excited for tonight's program. We had to up the number of tickets three times because it was so popular. Um, and I want to thank um, the co-sponsors, Washington Post, Library of Congress, and Capitol Hill Community Foundation for making this possible. Um, some reminders, could you please silence your cell phones? And um, we will be having East City Books selling Ada's books after the program, um, and she'll be, she'll be selling, uh, signing them as well. Um, so I'm going to introduce Rob Casper, head of, uh, head of Poetry and Literature at the Library of Congress. Uh, let me take this opportunity to take off my badge. Um, yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. What a crowd. I'm amazed. I thought, oh, uh, the bad weather would keep everyone away. Um, but you made it out. I promise you'll have fun tonight. Um, thanks, Laura, wherever you went, uh, for, for welcoming us. And thanks to everyone um, uh, for uh, uh, making the Hill Center such a wonderful home for this series. Um, thanks as well to the Washington Post for their support and to dear Ron Charles for uh, refusing to let shutdowns or snowstorms stop him from championing poetry. We have one event that uh, the second Life of a Poet I was not officially here at because it was the last shutdown. Yeah, that's why we have no tape of it. Uh, before I go any further, let me tell you a little bit about the Library of Congress and the Poetry and Literature Center. We are home to the U.S. Poet Laureate. The current Poet Laureate is Tracy K. Smith. She's the only federally funded uh, literary artist uh, in the country. Uh, in addition to uh, making sure the Poet Laureate uh, has a home, we uh, host a range of programs uh, in our Capitol Hill campus just down the street. Um, we'd love to have you come to our events at the library. You can check us out at www.loc.gov slash poetry. Uh, we also would love to know what you think about tonight's program. And to that end, you should have surveys uh, on your chairs. If you could fill them out and leave them after the event, that would be terrific. Um, this is the first event of our spring season, uh, and actually the first of our, <laughs> it is spring, it is spring, um, springy, um, we'll see, we'll see how Ross Gay does next week, if that's more spring-like, um, but, um, uh, tonight it's Ada's turn to, um, warm up the room, um, uh, uh Born in 1976, Limona is originally from Sonoma, California. She received an MFA uh, from New York University. Former poet laureate Phil Levine was her first teacher there. Uh, her first collection of poetry, luck, uh, it was a lucky record for, yeah, it was, it was the winner of the Autumn House Poetry Prize. Her second, the This Big Fake World, received the Pearl Poetry Prize. She has published three subsequent books of poetry with milkweed editions, including Sharks in the Rivers and Bright Dead Things, which was a finalist for the Kingsley Tufts Prize, National Book Award, and National Book Critics Circle Award. A former fellow at the Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center, Lamone has received a grant from the New York Foundation for the Arts and received the Chicago Literary Award for Poetry. She serves in the faculty of Queens University of Charlotte Low Residency MFA program and the online summer programs for the Provincetown Fine Arts Works Center. She also works as a freelance writer in Lexington, Kentucky, which is currently colder than even here. Lamone's fifth poetry collection, The Carrying, was named one of the top five poetry books of 2018 by none other than the Washington Post. As Elizabeth Lund writes, quote, a desire for connection runs throughout the work, as does the constant tension created by the gap between how life could be and how it really is. Evocative dreams and pivotal memories help make this collection a powerful example of how to carry the things that define us without being broken by them. 
It's no wonder the Carrying garnered Limone her second National Book Critics Circle Award nomination, as well as a nomination from the Penn Jean Stein Book Award, a $75,000 prize which recognizes a book-length work of any genre, not just poetry, for its originality, originality, merit, and impact that has broken new ground by reshaping the boundaries of its form and signaling strong potential for lasting influence. That is a mouthful. Uh, I am s absolutely certain the conversation we're about to hear shares just such potential. So get ready, get settled in, and please join me in welcoming Ada Lamont. There are so many people who've come before us. We want to try and be terrific. <laughs> even for an hour. <laughs> In one of your poems you write, shouldn't we make fire out of everyday things? That is exactly what you do. Thank you. I've had the greatest time the last few days reading all of her poems. And uh, now I'm gonna talk about some major themes with her and ask her to read as we talk, all right? So settle in. I know it's hard to concentrate. Uh, so many great poems flowing over you, but uh, we will do our best. Mm -hmm. And we'll take a little break in between. You studied theater in college, right? I did, yeah. My undergraduate degree is in theater. I think it shows in your verse. Oh, yeah. You said once, I love poetry for numerous reasons, but one very essential reason is that poetry is the only creative writing art form that builds breath into it. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's something an, an actor would know and notice. Yeah. What, do you mean, what do you mean about that? Well, I think about it with... Um, it actually has a place to breathe with a stanza break, right? And even a smaller breath with a line break. And the fact that um, it actually allows for a place for the reader to breathe. And in that empty space, we actually bring ourselves to the page so that the writer is not the only person experiencing the poem, but the reader is part of that journey. And the breath exchange is part of that. That's very intimate mm -hmm. for you as an artist to try and anticipate your reader's breathing, <laughs> not just their consciousness. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> the uh, biographical fallacy was one of those things I studied in college. We were told never to assume that the writer of the poem was the speaker of the poem. This is one of those new critical ideas that mm -hmm. now seems very out of date. <laughs> <clears throat> a, few, <laughs> a few years ago, uh, you said, uh, you confessed, most of my poems are autobiographical. Why does that feel like something that has to be confessed? Well, I think that we come from a place where we have to protect ourselves to a certain extent, right? So it's an, it's sometimes safer for a poet or an artist to say the speaker. Yes. Uh huh. Because then we can really... say, well, the speaker was having issues with this and that, you know. And then later on, you're like, okay, it was me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they built it on blindness or words of words, you know, in the field. Right. Like, there was no doubt that's who they were talking about. Right, I know. But there's a certain amount of, I think, protection that it allows us. I think it really came out of the workshop mode, so that when we're talking about a poem and giving help to the poem, yes. um, we're not necessarily saying, you need to fix your life here, right? But we can say, like, maybe the speaker should look at another way of entering this, you know? That's very interesting. <laughs> you think so the whole workshop industry I has shifted the, the speaker came out of that i think it's critical attitude because mm -hmm. you write about some very personal difficult things that the speaker goes through yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for instance uh infertility mm -hmm. infertility treatments and it's mm -hmm. a very intimate private thing and you write about it with great uh, with great uh, honesty and candor and it's, it's very moving is that hard to talk about publicly um no Luckily, I mean, I, it was, and I think that I wrote the book and then I was able to release a lot of it. Right. Um, and then when the book came out and I finally came to terms with everything, I think that I, I became very comfortable with it. Um, but in the beginning, yeah. In the beginning, they were, I was writing the poems without thinking of an audience, actually thinking that I was maybe writing them maybe just for my husband or just for a few friends. Right. Um, but I wasn't actually thinking of a book. Um, I wasn't even publishing them at the time because I needed to protect myself a little bit. I can imagine. But I also didn't know how to experience something like infertility and not write about it. It actually seemed very strange to me to, to not have an outlet 
um, because it is such a sensitive thing and sometimes people won't even share it because they don't want people to know they're going through treatments right. because then you don't want people to get excited, right? Exactly. Like, oh, you had a treatment. That means that, you know, and you're sitting there like, yeah, it means nothing. <laughs> yeah. You know, it might not mean anything. Yours was not a fertility story that ended in motherhood. Correct. Which is not a story we hear much of. No. Usually you hear very painful stories, but they always end in a child. Yeah, which I find that I feel like that's sort of a false setup that we yes. have a lot of times. With, Tremendously prejudicial. Right. That story and in memoirs in general, right? Like you never have like an addiction memoir that ends with like, oh, and he felt, you know, yes. he now has still has the problem. Everything is always like, and then we've solved all of life's issues. A child has come, yes. you know, these sort of these things. And um, I think that was why I felt like it was important to do. Definitely. Because it felt like I wanted to push against that falsehood. And many people experience what you've gone through. So. Many. I mean, so much so that I was surprised. Yes. Because people come up to me, people, dear friends who never talked about it with me. I just didn't know. What about the poems which deal with other people's intimate experiences? Mm. Your husband's, your mother's, your stepmother. Mm -hmm. That involves other emotional complications. Mm -hmm. Like permission? I ask permission. You do? I do. I think you should. I mean, I think that um, it's kind of hubris to assume that just because I am the artist, I am the only person who gets to speak. Yes. Um, and so I felt, I wrote the poems first, um, and then I asked. Uh, because I think I, if they had said no, you know, they might, well, I, they needed to see the poem, right. right? So I needed to be able to send the poem and say, is this okay with you? Um, and my mother was okay with both of those poems, but for a long time I wouldn't write about her experience because I was, um, because it wasn't my story. Right. And so I wrote so the poem not and just then, your story. right. And so then I wrote the poem and, and sent them to her. And um, I didn't hear back for like a half an hour, which is not like my mother. <laughs> I thought you were going to say like half a year. No. Half an like hour. Like my mother, like if my mother gets an email from me, she responds. So I was worried. <laughs> I think texting her. Did you get, and, uh, and my stepdad texted me. I thought, oh, this is bad. But he said, no, your mom, she's, she's crying. And she was really moved and couldn't quite figure out how to, you know, and then she composed herself and was like, yes, you, you, can, you can publish them. But I was, you know, it's very sensitive to write someone else's story. And I, I take it very seriously. Would you read the real reason? Sure. I should say that the reason it's called the real reason is because um, in Bright Dead Things, uh, there's a poem that is about why I don't have tattoos. And in the carrying this new book, I was trying to allow myself to maybe get deeper into certain situations. And I realized that this was actually the real reason. The real reason. I don't have any tattoos. is not my story to tell. It's my mother's. Once walking down Bedford Avenue in my 20s, I called her as I did, as I do. I told her how I wanted a tattoo on the back of my neck, something minor but permanent. And she is an artist. I wanted her to create the design, a symbol, a fish I dream of every night, an underwater talisman, a mother's gift on my body. To be clear, I thought she'd be honored. But do we ever really know each other fully? A silence like a hospital room. She was in tears. I swore then that I wouldn't get one wouldn't let a needle touch my neck, my arm, my torso. I'd stain me, my skin, the skin she welcomed me into the world with. It wasn't until later that I knew it wasn't so much the tattoo, but the marking, the idea of scars. What you don't know, and this is why this is not my story, is that my mother is scarred from burns over a great deal of her body. Most from an explosion that took her first child she was carrying in her belly. Others from the skin grafts where they took skin to cover what needed it. 
She was in her late 20s when that happened. Outside her studio in the center of town. You have to understand, my mother is beautiful. Tall, elegant, thin, and strong. I have not known her any other way. Her skin that I mapped with my young fingers, its strange hardness in places, its patterns like quilts here, riverbeds there. She's wondrous, preternatural, survived fire, the ending of an unborn child, heat and flame and death all made her into something seemingly magical, a phoenixess. What I know now is she wanted something else from me. For me to wake each morning and recognize my own flesh. For this one thing she made, me, to remain how she intended. For one of us to make it out unscathed. It's such a moving and affecting poem about our connectedness with our parents and the way we share bodies even and skin even mm -hmm. and our responsibilities to each other. Mm -hmm. So lovely. Thank you. Thank you. You write a lot about being a woman in sharp, often funny, <laughs> uh, rousing ways. I've got a poem called uh, Wonder Woman, mm. which is not what you expect <laughs> from the title. And also it involves another very intimate uh, physical condition. Mm -hmm. I won't say any more, but you, you feel free to. Yeah. Um, this poem, I should say, deals with, um, I have pretty severe scoliosis, and um, I also, um, have suffered from vertigo for about three years that comes on and off. And so this poem deals with that a little bit. Also takes place in New Orleans. Wonder Woman. Standing at the swell of the muddy Mississippi after the urgent care doctor had just said, well, sometimes shit happens. I fell fast and hard for New Orleans all over again. Pain pills swirled in the purse, along with a spell for later. It's taken a while for me to admit I am in a raging battle with my body, a spinal column 35 degrees bent, vertigo that comes and goes like a DC Comics villain nobody can kill. Invisible pain is both a blessing and a curse. You always look so happy, said a stranger once as I shifted to my good side, grinning. But that day, alone on the riverbank, brass blaring from the steamboat Natchez, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a girl, maybe half my age, dressed for no apparent reason as a Wonder Woman. She strutted by in all her strength and glory, invincible, eternal. And when I stood to clap, because who wouldn't have? She bowed and posed <laughs> like she knew I needed a myth. A woman by a river, indestructible. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so nice. uh, that's, uh, that's lovely. Uh, <clears throat> to think of this little girl inspiring you to overcome a pain that nobody else can see. Mm -hmm. Uh, that you don't even give any indication of. Mm. You're not giving any indication of it now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, Try not to. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you have another poem called How to Triumph Like a Girl, which is uh, mm. re related in a way, mm. but you're inspired by something very different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wrote this on the day um, before the Kentucky Derby, which is the Kentucky Oaks, which is when all the all the Phillies race. How to triumph like a girl. I like the lady horses best, how they make it all look easy. Like running 40 miles per hour is as fun as taking a nap or grass. I like their 
lady horse swagger after winning. Ears up, girls, ears up. But mainly, let's be honest, I like that they're ladies. As if this big, dangerous animal is also a part of me. That somewhere inside the delicate skin of my body, there pumps an eight pound female horse heart. Giant with power, heavy with blood. Don't you want to believe it? Don't you want to lift my shirt and see the huge, beating, genius machine that thinks, no, it knows it's going to come in first? It's like a feminist anthem. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's so uh, surprisingly eroticized and thrilling and tough. Thank you. It's really, really surprising. But you're just full of surprises. I mean, this poem about carrots. <laughs> I remember the carrots is where the title of the poem, the title of the collection comes from. Yeah. Someone uh, wrote me afterwards and they were like, so bright dead things are carrots? <laughs> and I was like, well, <laughs> not really. <laughs> but that is where, you know, yes. the inspiration came from. Which I thought was funny. I was like, no. <laughs> but... I remember the carrots. I haven't given up on trying to live a good life. A really good one, even. Sitting in the kitchen in Kentucky, imagining how agreeable I'll be. The advance of fulfillment and of desire. All these needs met, then unmet again. When I was a kid, I was excited about carrots. Their spidery neon tops in the garden's plot. And so I ripped them all out. I broke the new roots and carried them like a prize to my father, who scolded me rightly for killing his whole crop. I loved them, my own bright dead things. I'm 35 and remember all that I've done wrong. Yesterday, I was nice, but in truth, I resented the contentment of the field. Why must we practice this surrender? What I mean is, there are days I still want to kill the carrots because I can. <laughs> that, that boldness, that desire to exercise power because you can. Uh, you claim the traditionally male prerogative as your own. Mm -hmm. And then you mock it with carrots <laughs> at the same time. It's the kind of thing you do over and over again uh, in your poems where they seem, I was saying, telling you earlier, they seem accessible, and they are on one level, and then you realize suddenly there are all kinds of other things going on in the poem. Mm. Where did the, how did, you, how did you move from the image of the carrots to that larger theme in that poem? I think that I was fascinated by the idea that I still held that guilt, and that I remember that as something I'd done wrong. That, that uh, and that's a minor thing, right? I have many things that I've done wrong. Um, Your dad wasn't that angry. Right, although he does uh, claim that he's going to write a companion poem <laughs> called Carrot Crop Lost. <laughs> 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 Which he may. I don't know. Um, but no, and I think that, I, that, I, that first idea, of, like the things that, how it's so impossible to be happy, <laughs> to be contented, um, and that trying to find sort of equanimity and peace and live in a place where you aren't always desirous or fearful <laughs> um, or rageful or self-pitying, you know, what does that mean? And for some reason, the carrots and that idea of that I had been holding on to this. Um, and I think the reason I was holding on to it was because I still sometimes feel the need for destruction. Of course. It's right. never Like resolved. we all do. Exactly. Right. Right. And so... And we're all nice people. Right. But still. <laughs> and of course, I mean, like any poem, I don't think I knew where the poem was going until it went there. Right. Yeah. I love that. Uh, your paternal grandfather was from Mexico. Mm -hmm. You really complicate the discussion of diversity <laughs> in really interesting, brave ways. In one poem, you begin... Everyone is busted a little. 
And then in an interview, you once said, it seems that in an attempt to encourage diversity and to celebrate differences, there is still an overwhelming need for categorization. In the same thing you write, maybe you don't ever say it for yourself. Maybe you move your mouth like everyone moves their mouth. Maybe your mouth is the same mouth as everyone's, all trying to say the same thing. That's a very provocative claim to make mm. in a world where we are very skeptical of universal truths, mm -hmm. uh, universal experiences, universal values. What if you'd read a poem, a prose poem? Mm -hmm. First time we've ever read a prose poem because I hate them. Yeah, <laughs> fascinating, fascinating. I'm learning about you. <laughs> This one's for my brother, my older brother, I should say. I got his permission for this one, too. Okay. But it was a little late in the game. I was like, this book's coming out. <laughs> <laughs> That's not permission. <laughs> That's forgiveness. Uh, yeah, it was. It was forgiveness. <laughs> but I would have pulled it <laughs> if he had an issue with okay. it. Okay. Prickly pear and fisticuffs. My older brother says he doesn't consider himself Latino anymore, and I understand what he means, but I stare at the weird fruit in my hand, and I wonder what it is to lose a spiny layer. He's explaining how white and lower middle class we grew up and how we don't know anything about any culture except maybe Northern California culture, which means we get stoned more often <laughs> and frown on superstores. I want to do whatever he says. I want to be something entirely without words. I want to be without tongue or temper. Two days ago in Tennessee, someone said, stop it, Ada's Mexican. And I didn't know what they were talking about until one of them said, at least I didn't say wet back. And everyone laughed. Honestly, another drink and I could have hit someone. Started the night's final fight. And I don't care what he says. My brother would have gone down swinging and fought off every redneck whitey in the room. Yeah, that gets right to it. <laughs> right to it. The way that poem moves and the tension that it's never resolved. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You've talked about the tension between tokenism and inclusion. Mm. Mm -hmm. one, one is condescending, one mm -hmm. is desirable. Yeah. And they look alike sometimes. Yeah, and they feel very different. Yes. You say, uh, there are times where I feel like I've been invited somewhere or that I'm being asked to speak because I'm Latino background or because I'm a Latino poet. Other times, a lot of times, I'm with Latino poet brothers and sisters and I feel like the whitest girl in the room. Mm -hmm. So there's this interesting struggle of what world I fit into. I think I'm done feeling guilty on either side now. I think it's actually this in-between space that intrigues me the most. You've got a really witty, daring poem called the contract says, we'd like the conversation to be bilingual. <laughs> you might have to set this up a little bit, but uh, this I imagine is the kind of thing one gets from a book festival or mm -hmm. a poetry festival. Yeah. And you notice this one line in the contract. Yeah, which was interesting because that it, clearly it meant they knew nothing of my work <laughs> or my background <laughs> because I'm not fluent in Spanish. I can understand a lot of it, but... Um, but it just, they kind of threw it in there, like, oh, yeah. And then we'll have the conversation. So it was a conversation like this. Yes. But they wanted it to be entirely bilingual. You could not do that. Right. Um, what do you say? I, I mean, I just wrote back and, you know. Send them this poem. Yeah, basically wrote this poem. Yeah. Um, and I will say, you know, that it's also a poem for my father. The contract says, we'd like the conversation to be bilingual. When you come, bring your brownness so we can be sure to please the funders. Will you check this box? We're applying for a grant. Do you have any poems that speak to troubled teens? Bilingual is best. Would you like to come to dinner with the patrons and sip Patron? Will you tell us the stories that make us uncomfortable but not complicit? Don't read us the one where you are just like us, born to a greenhouse, a garden, 
Don't tell us how you picked tomatoes and ate them in the dirt, watching vultures pick apart another bird's bones in the road. Tell us the one about your father, stealing hubcaps, after a colleague said that's what his kind did. Tell us how he came to the meeting wearing a poncho and tried to sell the man his hubcaps back. <laughs> Don't mention your father was a teacher, spoke English, loved making beer, loved baseball. Tell us again about the poncho, the hubcaps, how he stole them, how he did the thing he was trying to prove he didn't do. <laughs> that is a really brave poem uh, and makes many of us were laughing out of nervousness or I mean as an editor it's one of my expressed goals is to try and get a better mix of mm -hmm. viewers and books yeah and sometimes we pick people because we hope they bring that mm -hmm. because they check the box yes i know so yeah and there's a gift is that to it wrong? right is it necessarily it's gift, condescending the gift to that inclusion that you know the gift of inclusion the gift of celebrating different voices right. all, all of that is good. beautiful it's all great so when does it turn sour when does it ferment think, into something i think poisonous? you know oftentimes the intention is there where it is not about the work at all and that's where i think as an artist you feel it the most um, I was at a writer's festival, I won't say the name of it, but, uh, you know, where we were, some, someone had dropped out and I was standing with a friend of mine, a wonderful Mexican poet, and um, we were together and, and they said, what, you know, do you know anyone in New York that could come up on the train and like, you know, fill the slot? And we gave a name of another writer who happened to be Mexican, he was a great writer. And she said, she pointed at us and said, well, no, we already have two <laughs> Latino poets. <laughs> and that's when you know, yeah. in that instant, right, yeah. why you're there. Yeah, that is. And it wasn't about my work. It makes me cringe. Yeah. So I think that there is, you know, very, it's actually, you can feel it more than you know. Um, but at the same time, I don't think that this is pushing against inclusion or, you know, the, right. I think when it's about the work, and it's authentically about the work, then it's great. You know, it should be celebrated and it should be where we're moving towards. Um, but I think that, that, you know, the danger of also being performative as like, well, now we will have these voices represented and you are here to represent this voice, right? And yes. then you, you know in that instant, oh, wait, no, I'm, I'm not here for, to represent my own poems or who I am or who I am as a complicated, person who is both Mexican, both white, you know, all of these things, and I'm not allowed to be that person. And when that's taken away from me, then part of my humanity is taken away. Yes. It's a quota. Right. And so the complexity and all that makes me human um, is what I want to be celebrated for or recognized for, not something that um, happens to be because I have an accent over my O. Now that doesn't, doesn't mean that I want also to um, be given the opportunity, if I can, to celebrate writers, especially Latinx writers, you know, that's, yes. a, that's a goal in my life, yes. you know? But I think that it, there, you know, I wanna make sure that I'm not, ju not just going through a folder and being like, oh, these people have this name, right? right? It has to be about the work. First and foremost, always has to be about the work. And when you feel that, that's you feel the inclusion. Right. And we don't feel that, it feels like tokenism. Perfect. Yeah. I think the only way to get at that is through irony. Yeah. Through wit. Right. And I think um, the thing about that poem is that is a true story. My dad was a teacher for a long time, and he, at this point, was a school administrator. And someone said that he wouldn't park his car over in a certain community because all the Mexicans there would steal his hubcaps. And my father went out into the parking lot and stole the man's hubcap. <laughs> and the next faculty meeting wasn't for like another week. And my dad came in with a poncho and a sombrero. Wow. And he had the, his hubcaps like lined inside the poncho and was like, hey, you guys want some hubcaps? And he played this role for this guy. That's great. And made this real point to him, you know, and really destroyed him, you know. Yes. But, 
with this humor. I mean, yes. it was just, and so when my father um, retired from that particular school district, they gave him an engraved hubcap. <laughs> Well, it's a true story. <laughs> That's great. That's great. I gotta beat this guy. <laughs> and I wanna read that. I wanna read your carrot poem too. Mm -hmm. uh, I want you to all to stand up, turn around, and sit back down. <laughs> this is this our break? Yep. All right. It's not an intermission. You're not leaving the room. You're not even leaving your chair. You're just standing up. <laughs> you all must stand up. <laughs> okay, sit down. <laughs> Because we're going to talk about grief and dying. Oh, yay. Some of my favorite topics. Your poems about grief and illness are just devastating, largely because they're so beautiful. Thank you. Uh, because they force us into a, a kind of emotional intimacy with things we don't want to think about. Right. In one of your poems, you write, isn't it funny? Isn't it funny how the cold numbs everything but grief? If we could light up the room with pain, we'd be such a glorious fire. In another poem, reflecting on the impending loss of your stepmother, I believe, you write, this is not a unique story. What we have in our hands is an unsolvable thing. It's the passage that perplexes us, this full weight that must take us down. On the PBS NewsHour, you said, poetry is a place where both grief and grace can live. Hmm. Help us understand that. What do you mean, what do you mean by that? I think that um, acknowledging mortality is one of the goals and purposes of, of poetry. I think that that idea of when we know that we're going to leave this world, there is an sort of saturation of colors that happens and an idea of loving the world becomes deeper. Um, and in that connection to our own mortality and to our family's mortality and to every stranger's mortality and to everyone's mortality, it goes wider and wider to the point of that grief is actually what helps us recommit to being in the world. Um, because knowing it's going to end, how could you not celebrate it? One must mourn things daily as a cause for continuing, you write. Mm -hmm. You're not a religious person. Mm -mm. You've got all the right material. <laughs> you approach that tension in very striking, haunting ways. I wonder if you'd read section 11 of a poem called 13 Feral Cats. Oh, wow. It's been a while. It's a beautiful cycle. Thank um, you. The Buddhists say it is of our nature to die, but that doesn't seem enough, does it? The bees in our body released, the wasps in the heart. Once above where a woman nursed, a wasp nest grew in the ceiling. At first, only a tiny discoloration, the spreading stain of larvae pupate, only looked like an upside-down puddle. No one wanted to kill them. The child in this woman's arms, only one month old, the wasps growing along with them. We wanted them to grow up and leave eventually, the wasps and the child. But what grows in us and around us may not always be protected by mandates of good nature. One wasp nest contains 3,000 to 5,000 wasps. 19 stings is considered the lethal dose of wasp venom for a full grown adult. When the first leg dropped through the plaster and paint, white dust landed on the child's forehead. By the sixth leg, everyone was out of the house until soon all the wasps were dead white poison covering their small bodies, still preserved in their home, like a tiny winged Pompeii. That contrast between this helpless newborn baby 
and thousands of deadly wasps above the baby is just an indelible image. Where'd that come from? The true story. Yeah, that was my little brother in my stepmother's arms. Jeez. And we really, it was just a discoloration at first. Yes. And then suddenly, you know, and we weren't, we were just thinking it'll, they'll move on, you know, and then we didn't want to call the exterminator. And then the legs, you could see that like that it had gone so heavy, yes. right? As they do, yes. that the legs started to come through. And then we had to call the exterminator. And then, of course, they pull it out once it's, right. and, it's and it's just so sad because it's yes. just all of these wasps. Yeah. So this life and death, mm -hmm. uh, newness and terror. Yeah. And for a child, you know, for an infant, yeah. it's really dangerous. Of course. Yeah, especially at that point, you don't know if there's any allergy. Right, too, so. right. Another um, one of these poems, section 13, I'm sorry, uh, you'll have to read the whole uh, cycle on your own. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could read uh, section 13. This morning, when I opened the screen door, the cats were standing on a wooden ladder next to the house one for each rung. At first glance, they were after nothing, scrambling for oblivion, until I saw the bee blazing in circles above their, them near the roof. When the door slammed, they turned as if to say, this is why we've come here, for this moment, to chase anything that might get away. As if we were put here to remember our own ending, to wander out into the streets, their own brutal oblivion, to stare at the tree's dark bark, to know that in order to go on, we must accept the cage we are given, that someday we will be released into the unimaginable, and until then, praise the walls and all the parts of us they manage to hold so dearly. I don't care what you say, that is a prayer. <laughs> it is just a prayer. Thank you. In order to go on, we must accept the cage we are given. And until then, praise the walls and all the parts of us manage to hold so dearly. Is writing about loss and grief therapeutic, cathartic? Does it give you a greater understanding of what you went through? I think that I don't know how to go through something difficult without writing through it. Um, I don't always do anything with the poems. Like sometimes those poems, you know, are written in the white hot moment of grief and or anger and you think they're kind of killer when you write them and then the next day you're like, wow, I got to throw that one away. Um, but I, I don't know how to experience something big without, I think the writing saves me over and over again. Um, and it's my way of, processing and dealing with it. I think when my mother, my stepmother was diagnosed with cancer, um, she was sick for six years. And so processing not only uh, the diagnosis um, and what it is to actually live with a diagnosis, right? With the, the sort of impending death and to know that, you know, she had colon cancer. It, you know, she lived for, they gave her six months. She lived for six years. It's great. It's amazing. Um, and I think it was primarily because my younger brother was 12 at the time and she was like, I want to make it till he's 18. And she did. And I literally feel like it was her will of thinking, I want to see him when he's an adult right. or, you know, yeah. 18. Right. And, <laughs> and she did. And, uh, and so, and then, and then writing about that loss. So writing about her death, um, and it was a home death that I was, um, a part of, it was, my dad had called me and said, you know, it was sort of when that you get that call and like the person who always makes sense, is it making sense? Mm -hmm. um, and he was like, so we've got it. And I was like, okay, I'm going to book a flight tomorrow. He was like, okay. <laughs> okay. You know, normally I think he'd refuse help. And he was like, yeah, yeah, come home. Um, and so I went home for a month and, you know, we helped her die. And it was still maybe the biggest honor of my life. Mm -hmm. How old was she? She was only 52. Jeez. Sorry. Yeah. She was only 52. Um, and, you know, I mean, that kind of, I wasn't writing while I was going through it. 
I was reading and I was sketching and she and I were drawing together sometimes and um, and I'm not an artist. It was just, you know, what something to do. Um, she was. She wasn't. No, oh, yeah, she wasn't an artist. But we just, you know, we're, it was, what do you do with time? She was like, I don't want to watch TV. You know, like she's like, they say, right. the nurse kind of is like, we'll move the TV down. And she's like, she never even was a TV person. She's like, I don't want to, no. you know, so we just did stuff. Nice. Um, and And then it wasn't until after she passed that I was able to, you know, the poem that, we just read the 13 um, feral cats was written before she passed away. Um, and then bright dead things was the book that came out after she passed away. Should read after the fire. Yeah. This was, um, I'm originally from Sonoma, California and, um, you know, they had those devastating fires. And I had lots of friends lose homes. And I have an apartment there on a friend's property. Um, and it came within five feet of the front door. And I was very, very lucky. But also, you know, there were a lot of people that were really hurt. And a lot of people, you know, whose lives had changed, you know. And so this is a poem about that. After the fire. You ever think you could cry so hard that there'd be nothing left in you? Like how the wind shakes a tree in a storm until every part of it is run through with wind. I live in the low parts now, most days a little hazy with fever and waiting for the water to stop shivering out of the body. Funny thing about grief, its hold is so bright and determined like a flame, like something almost worth living for. I was reminded of Emily Dickinson's poem, After Great Pain, A Formal Feeling Formal Comes. Formal Feeling Comes, yeah. The same, the after pain, the this, this stunning uh, penumbra of that tragedy right. that you live in. And what that does and how sometimes just feeling that grief, whether it's the loss of a loved one or heartbreak, is actually the thing that you feel beholden to. Yes, it, yeah. You know, that that's the thing that you have to honor. Yes. Like that your life becomes about, I have to carry this grief and hold on to it and honor it and describe it and I will live for this grief. Yes, I understand that. Yeah. You push back against grief in really beautiful ways. Even without religion, there is a kind of faith in your poems. Mm. A poem like The Crossing. Can you read mm. The Crossing? Yeah. It seems like a very difficult poem to read aloud. But it's very... We'll difficult. see. <laughs> yeah. We'll see what happens. If you, if you can't, if you can't, it's okay. <laughs> Understand. Uh, this poem was written for my stepmom, and um, you know when someone, and I'm sure you've experienced this, but when someone you love uh, passes away, and especially if it's terminal cancer, and so that you have time or terminal illness, so you have time to talk about things, that discussion about you know what happens next, you know, and um, we weren't religious people. Um, I was raised an atheist, uh, spiritual, but I don't believe in organized religion. Um, and so there's certain rules and things that open up for us because we don't have this idea of what comes next. And we talked about this. The Crossing for Cynthia. We drive up to Smoky Point and the Sno Snoqualmie River is muddy. The fish have been crossing for days. All night, the news of coho crossings, sightings of those swimming, beaming finners. One band of sun holds its hands down on the field, but the water is still deep, the inaccessible earth. The dark birds and scissors cut the sky into gray and grayer, two halves of the same strange atmosphere. 
The trees stand up straight for now, and the old barbecue is gone, but a whole cement village has bricked the land over in its place. Every neon sign says stop. Every market sells a season. Poor black capped chickadee trapped in its rafters. The medication has made your face different. Your skin's not the same you lived in. We wait at the train tracks as a new deluge comes, a bold blundering sky of fresh water, a single leaf on a tree, one big leaf maple child, a wet dog on a cement heap. You say you wish there was a way you could come back to find out who your wild son grows up to be. If that house stands up to the years of rain, if your dear husband stands up to the years of rain, a car alarm, a fire truck, maybe there is a way. Like fish in the cold fall storms, maybe we do. Our bodies unskinned and unadorned, making our way to the place our beatings belong, our pulsing light flashing up a river. Silvery across a flooded highway, our human faults forgiven, a returning to the first uncomplicated river system, blood to blood to blood, until we are carried around in the world like one grateful fish, escaping the lure and seeing the same moon it has seen for 10,000 years, the same moon our other dear fishes see. Maybe, I say, my own tenuous connection, maybe the railroad crossing released, the car pushing toward home, Maybe, I say to you, maybe we do come back. I feel like that um, poem, she's with me every time I read a poem about her. Exactly. I mean, that's yeah. the beautiful thing about the poem is when you read it, she comes back. Yeah. And I've always thought, you know, I, I read this somewhere and I'm, I don't know who said it. And um, it's true though, which is that like writing is a great way of performing resurrection. And I feel like that when I talk about the honoring of grief and like the actually living for grief, that is part of it. Right. is that I feel like it is my job. It's one of the oldest poet's jobs. Mm -hmm. The elegy. In, in, morum, in memoriam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Uh, the elegy, which is, of course, the greatest love poem. Right. Yeah. Did she, was she able to read that poem or she passed? She was. That's great. She was able to read it, yeah. In fact, I, um, I uh, was asking her, I said, you know, if, if you're uncomfortable at you, because it's the book is dedicated for Cynthia. And I said, uh, you know, I can say for C if you want to just have your, and she looked at me and she was, you know, she was in the bed, she was going to die. And then she said, uh, I was literally doing the edits in this book with her on her deathbed. And she said to me, why would you say C? You've only ever called me Cynthia. And it was so like, she was so like, I was like, right, of course. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. That's nice. <laughs> <clears throat> There's another very different poem about resurrection involving a possum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the and poor it almost possum. seems sacrilegious to read it after that poem. Mm. But it. Uh, but not really. No, I was going to say because. Because it, actually, it yeah. Ends, it ends with a very similar theme. Mm hmm. It just gets there in a very different way. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, this was a, a poem that I, it was a true story. And, you know, this book dealt with a lot of, I had lived in New York for 12 years, and then I moved to um, Lexington, Kentucky. And uh, we had just moved into our new apartment together, our first apartment together. And we lived out in the country. Um, a sort of cool old house. It was an old tobacco way station. 
in the country of resurrection. I should also say we moved, Cynthia died in 2010, February of 2010. Um, Sharks in the Rivers that I just read from came out in October or, or September of 2010. So it was right after her death. I moved to Lexington, I fell in love May of 2010 and moved to Lexington. So I basically, like she died and then I fell in love and began this new relationship. And so even my relationship now with my husband is very much linked to her death and also who I am as an artist and where I went with my work is very much linked to her death. And so even though this poem deals with it in a way that it's not her death, it's, I should say that she's in all of these poems. In the Country of Resurrection. Last night, we killed a possum out of mercy in the middle of the road. It was dying, its face was bloody, the back legs were shattered. The mistake I made was getting out of the car. You told me not to, but I wanted to be sure, needed to know for sure that it could not be saved. Someone else had hit it. The sound it was making. The sound folded me back into the airless car. Do it, do it fast. I lowered my head until the thud was done. You killed it quiet. We drove home under the sickle moon Laundry gone cold and dry on the line. But that was last night. This morning, the sun is coming alive in the kitchen. You've gone to get us gas station coffee, and there is so much life all over the place. There is so much life all over the place. That's so reassuring and so damn offensive when someone you love has died. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because how can that be alive? Right. And how can the sun come up? Yes. Like how dare you? Exactly. <laughs> how, right? Yes. How dare you rise again? Like if she doesn't get to rise, how dare you rise? Yeah. And I think that um, that level of like also needing the light, right? And wanting to celebrate it. And then also always being surprised that it's still being here, that life is continuing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that it seems so bizarre that you just go on. Right. And everyone's like, oh yeah, so get yeah. your coffee and you're just kind of left there like, wait, what? It is the strangest thing. It's the strangest thing. And yet everyone goes there. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. That's what's so wild to me. We have another poem called um, The Great Blue Heron on Dunbar Road. Mm. And it's about your father, uh, or stepdad. My stepdad. A uh, recovered alcoholic, mm -hmm. uh, driving you to school. And every day you cheer each other up by seeing the blue heron. He spots it sometimes, you spot it sometimes. And it becomes this sort of symbol of, uh, of life, of uh, the future. And like the beauty. day was going to be good if we yes, saw the blue heron. Good day. Yeah. But then, you know, the pond dries up, yep. uh, the blue heron goes away, mm -hmm. but you still see it. Yeah. Or you still imagine you do. Or we still pretend we do. Or you still pretend you do. For it's, each other. I just, it's like cognitive behavioral therapy <laughs> right there, you know? Yeah. You just, you just, you see the blue heron. Yeah. Because it makes a better day. Yes. Whether the blue heron's there or not is almost irrelevant. Mm -hmm. You see it. Yeah. And we'd uh, sort of make up stories and say, no, I think it just, see the rustling over there? I think it just took off. Exactly. You know, we would just lie to each other that we'd seen the blue heron. I don't think it was a lie. Of, it wasn't a lie. It was a, but it was, but it wasn't. St. Paul talks we about it. We believe it. Right. St. Paul says the evidence of things not seen. Yes. That's exactly. the blue heron. Exactly. I just, I just love that. Uh, I'll talk about love. We are winding down here, but I do want to move to love. Because love is one of the things that pushes back against grief in your mm. poems. Uh, did you read this poem, Overjoyed? Mm. Yeah. Overjoyed. 
What's the drunk wax wing supposed to do when all day's been an orgy of red buds on the winery's archway off Garricky Road, and it's too far to make it home, too long to fly, even as the sober crow goes? What's the point of passion when the pyracantha berries keep the blood turned toward obsess, obsess? Don't you want those birds, don't you know those birds are going to toss themselves into the streets for some minor song of happiness? And who can blame them? This life is hard. And let me be the first to admit that I, if I, when I come across some jewel of pleasure, I too want to squeeze the thing until even its seedy heart evaporates like ethanol. Want to throw my bird bones into the brush fire until half blind, all I can hear is the sound of wings in the relentlessly delighted air. <laughs> That's a change of pace. You know, you know Ross Gay? Desire, the poem, desire. The poet who's coming uh, next week, you know Love Ross Gay, Ross Gay yes. This kind of reminds me of the kind of mm -hmm. thing he would respond to. Totally. Yes, uh, just the unbounded joy. Yeah. Passion yeah. without and the, ad and the, ad the admission of obsession and the admission of, you know, sometimes we do want all the things like, you know, that I would want to squeeze any, you know, squeeze yes. every last little bit out of it. Yes. You know, and I feel like he does that well. Yes. And you do, you do too. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to end with one poem from this book. Oh, I love that. It's the epilogue. Yeah. We won't even talk about the book. Just the last poem. <laughs> Epilogue. This big fake world. The object is to not simply exist in this world of radio clocks and moon pies where holidays and lunch breaks bring the only relief from the machine that is our own mind humming inside of its shell. Shouldn't we make a fire out of everyday things, build something out of too many nails and not wonder if we are right to build without permission from the other dull furniture? Out of this small plot we are given, small plot of cement and electrified wires, small plot of razors and outlandish liquor names, let's make a nest, each of us, of our own pieces of glass and weeds and names we have found. Somewhere along the banks of this liquid world, let us all hold close to the lost and the unclear, and in our own odd little way, find some refuge here. That is your benediction. Thank you. Uh, uh, sign books. Come back next week for Ross Gay on Wednesday, Wednesday. a week from today. We're hoping that uh, it's not Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank up. you. That, I will Thank never you. forget this. Thank you so much. Oh, that was so that wonderful. Was beautiful. You were amazing. You very much. Oh, easy.